Hi, everybody. This is Mark Graben from Kinexus, and I'm happy to be uh, playing the role of host and moderator for today's webinar, which is titled How a Community Hospital is Creating a Culture of Continuous Improvement. And our presenter today is Mike McGowan from Marietta Memorial Hospital in Ohio. And I'm really excited that you have tuned in. And if you don't work for a hospital, I, I think there are going to be um, some good lessons learned and, and ideas here that will be applicable for different types of organizations. So thank you uh, for signing in. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my friend and our uh, presenter today, Mike McGowan. Um, Mike uh, has a background in uh, hospital laboratory. He has actually a, a more interesting background. I think I'll let him tell you uh, what his undergrad degree is as, as he introduces uh, himself. Uh, but Mike has been um, there uh, within uh, the Memorial Health System uh, in uh, various roles, Senior Director of Ancillary Services, most recently the Director of Process Excellence. And I first met Mike when he was a student at uh, The Ohio State University, I think you're supposed to say it that way, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, um, in Columbus, V Columbus, Ohio, where he was studying in an excellent program there called Masters of Business and Operational Excellence, or MBOE. Uh, so I mentored Mike uh, with his project and had a chance to visit him in the hospital a few times, and it's been great keeping in touch with Mike and learning about the progress that he and the organization have been making. You know, Mike has always been a very eager uh, student of Lean, and um, I'm happy to have him presenting here today. Um, so Mike, thank you again, and I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Mark, and I was actually mentored by the Mark Graben, so that was <laughs> that was a positive for me. Um, and so, yeah, I guess a little bit about myself quickly, as I did start out in laboratory, um, and we, we did some projects in lab, and then uh, as we started to see some successes there, the administration suggested we do this uh, Master's of Business Operational Excellence, and then we have since created a team, and so I'm here to talk to you about what we've tried to do for the last five or six years on changing the culture uh, of, a, of a hospital, a small hospital system, um, to be thinking more about continuous improvement. So I want to talk about, and we want to see how what we use, we, we decided to use some different training roles to build and spread a, a culture of continuous improvement and lean and Six Sigma. Um, we'll talk about what we did well and where we could improve. I think maybe the where we could improve is, is, is a little bit more bigger. And talk about some leadership behaviors that are necessary to, to make this change. Anytime that you're trying to change a culture can be very, very frustrating and can, it's, just, it's a lot of hard work, I think. I think that my team would tell you. I want to preface this discussion by saying that what I'm going to talk about is not necessarily a prescriptive um, roadmap for someone to follow. It was just our ideas of how we worked in our culture and knowing the folks that were running the business and working in the business. So um, I would like this to be a really good exchange of ideas. Um, you know, some of the stuff may work for you and some may not. So we'll We'll, we'll, we'll throw it up there and, and see what kind of feedback we get. So a little bit of background about us, the Memorial Health System. We're in southeastern Ohio, and we're kind of um, geographically isolated a little bit from um, the larger institutions so that uh, our role and our goal at, and I, I'm not going to read you the different things, you can read those, are at the, this place is to keep care um, local. Um, it's a good two-hour drive to any major medical center for us, for our, for our, our community. So our goal is we, we have two hospitals and three emergency departments and urgent care centers. We kind of own the city from a health care healthcare, uh, standpoint. And so we are striving to remain independent. We are an independent hospital and uh, keep as much care locally as we can. And at the, at the last point there, we started our journey in 2013. Uh, officially, where we, we we commissioned a team of CI specialists, continuous improvement specialists, and uh, um, started working mostly as um, project based. We uh, we were doing projects in different areas of the of the pro of the system. So the team is made up of six six lean six sigma black belts and led by me, the director, 
Uh, and as Mark mentioned, I have uh, I completed the Master's of Business Operational Excellence from the Ohio State University. That's how we're trained to say it. Um, uh, and I think that they will always keep the director level position with that with that degree. Should I retire, hopefully soon in the next few months, week, years? I mean, um, and then our black belts successfully completed online training and coaching through more steam. Um, so we know that there are um, they know their stuff and they and they can handle just about anything thrown at them. Um, so like I say we started out with uh, mostly project based. And what we started to see over the years was that um, we'd do a project and there'd be some good imp you know, implementation of countermeasures and we'd see some progress. And then we'd go back in six or eight months and it was all gone. Uh, we've seen that happen two or three different times. And we were trying to figure out how we can really begin to uh, hardwire changes and make sure that um, things stick once you get done. A lot of that comes back to leadership. But we also wanted to do some, you know, train leaders and what they needed to do. So we developed. Uh, and I think Mark, they heard my team went to one of Mark's workshops and heard um, the idea of training different levels uh, of people and, and trying to do this through training. And so we developed um, five different roles, and I'll, I'll go through each one here at the, hey, at the hospital. Too. Yes. Uh, and before we go into those roles, I, I was going to go ahead and jump in as you invited, uh, had invited with a question. Um, you say there were six black belts. What, what was the process? Because people often ask, well, how many of this type of person, this role should we have? Like, what, what was the process or was it kind of experimental over time to determine that six black belts was, was it a good number? Was it the right number? How do you think about that? Great question. Yeah, so it started out with three and we had actually had built it with to have uh, me and a couple of black belts and we had thought about hiring someone to do some statistical analysis for us. But then as we started to begin to work, we saw that that third, you can't have someone do your statistical analysis for you. You have to understand what's going on in the in the department or in the area that you're working. So we, we went to three, and then we added a fourth um, out, of, out of some necessity that we were, we were having a lot of projects. And then when, you, when we look at our strategic plan, this is a good segue, um, we created a strategic plan in our department on an X matrix that by 2021, we would have a black belt working as a dyad uh, with directors in the more, quote, high-profile departments. So for those of you who aren't in healthcare, you won't understand this, but healthcare, surgery, pharmacy, imaging lab, they may be nursing and materials, um, that they would work hand-in-hand -hand with the director to help solve, pro solve problems and improve their services. Um, so then to that effect, we want to train 2,000 frontline staff. So the number, Mark, is, is we were going to try to get to eight, okay, at least, mm -hmm. um, so that we could – so that was a long-term goal. So we're at six now, and we'll talk about why we kind of paused that here later on. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to start – been our goal was to train 2,000 frontline staff as white belts, and we'll talk about that, uh, what that, what that means. But we want to get the learning out to people. We want them to understand um, – you know what it is, what it is we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish, and so we're looking at different levels of training. So that's how we got to the to the six at this point, and we'd like to go to eight, and even our plan calls for ten, so that we can kind of keep a team and have some people still embedded. But we put a pause on that for now. Mm -hmm. So we also want to train all current and new leaders as yellow belts. We've been accomplishing that, and then we'd like to have at least ten leaders complete the work to earn green, what we call green belts. Now we could debate the belts, but it is just a a uh, different level of learning uh, for each of the individuals. And, 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 I, and I hope to get more improvement and more learning at the front line. So that's why 2,000 front lines. We have 2,500 currently working for us now. Mm -hmm. So the white belts, yeah, they're, they're, gonna, they're the front line staff. Um, we, we do a two-hour um, workshop with them. And just to give them the structure and goals, uh, an understanding of, when, of what we're talking about when we talk about lean or six sigma. They need to understand the basic vocabulary terms. And we, and we expect them and we train them to enter opportunities for improvement or things that they see in Kinexus. So if they're working on a project, Kinexus is our, obviously our um, software tool. If they're working on a project, they can um, 
put that in the into the Kinexus system, and then the, the leader has should respond to them. And then they would participate on project improvement teams as the departments are in our vision. The the, the department, the Diane, the, the director would be working with a, a black belt, and uh, then all the folks underneath them would have some level of training, so we could be, begin to improve the entire system. And then uh, our yellow belts, these are typically department directors or our leaders. We want them to understand the basic lean concepts and tools, and we throw some tools at them. We do a two-day workshop with them, and then they are expected to complete a project that has certain uh, tools that we associate with it. So they need to be able to complete a value stream map. They need to be able to uh, come up with some graphs and KPI for their project. And then we would expect them to participate on teams and lead teams uh, and assist with white belt training. And we haven't gotten quite there yet, but we've got we've got some people trained. We've been working on that. Um, green belts. That's our that's kind of our bigger dream of some. This would be the yellow belt that. Um, oh, and our our yellow belt. Go back. Our white belt completes. There's a ten question quiz at the end of the the white belt to make sure they're there and paying attention. And our yellow belts have to not only complete the project, they have to complete a 50 question exam. To to rise to the green belt level, we would expect someone who's done yellow belt to complete three other A3s under the guidance of one of our coaches, one of our black belts. And we would expect them to really be a big, big leader in A3 improvements in the system uh, and help with uh, training of other folks uh, in, in their department. So these would be again directors that have different levels of, of working with lean and then our black belts these are the, the continuous improvement team um, we expect them to work with leaders to identify gaps and and select improvement projects and believe it or not that's what's really hard sometimes is to come up with what are we going to work on we know we need to get better uh, and it's hard to get directors to put that into words and come up with exactly what they're, they're working on um, and then they coach and teach and mentor and train and they're responsible for lean six sigma uh, implementation throughout the the culture, and we, they do most of the training for green, yellow, and white belts. So that's the that's the structure that we've created. And on our and I want to go backwards, but the, on our uh, the slide with the five people on it, we put the white belt first because those other belts, the white white belt is the frontline staff. Those other belts support that. They're all support roles for that frontline staff doing the job. We try and preach that and teach that so that everyone knows that that's where it's supposed to be supposed to be happening, the improvement's supposed to be happening. And then we have a champion who uh, is our usually one of our vice presidents or executive leaders who would who would help, you know, select things that we need to work on and remove barriers and to support the change uh, as we develop uh, the culture. So, so let's see where I'm Mike, maybe we can do a few questions before um, before we move into um, the next uh, section of the slides. So um, can you talk a little bit more, um, because like you said, for people who are outside of healthcare, um, might not be familiar with the idea of a, a dyad leadership structure in healthcare. I mean, I think in other industries, sometimes you have, quote unquote, two in a box where you might have a technical person and a business person. Um, working together in a leadership role. Can you can you give a little bit more background of you know how that works in in healthcare and and why that dyad structure was something you then applied uh, to the the uh, embedding belts? Well, we haven't. We've only done it successfully in one area currently in pharmacy. We have one of our black belts who is who is uh, assigned. You know, her role is to be in pharmacy, working with the pharmacy team, and, and we're seeing some pretty good improvement there. Um, the idea is just to be a coach, uh, to be the sensei. When we try and stay away from the the, the Japanese words, but sometimes you gotta you gotta you gotta use them um, to to help them and say we have a problem. So how do we how how are we gonna solve this? What are you know what are we gonna use to make the work better? I mean, in pharmacy, one of the things that we did um, that, that you know they were they were having a lot of mm, IV medications being brought back that they had to re-put back into the system, and they were but they were processing this one in one big batch a day, and and couldn't understand why all these are coming back. Well, patients are discharged, right? They don't use them, and so we got them working in a more continuous, uh, well, it's three batches. We're well, not continuous flow yet, but they're doing it in three batches. So they've dramatically reduced the amount of medications they have to send out and 
log back into the system. So um, that's just that kind of being able to see that because the director is really busy doing other things. So the, the dyad person working up there can go, go and work with frontline staff with the support of the director. So that's kind of like an arm of the director almost. And we haven't really fleshed all that out yet. We've only done it in one department. We haven't really written any structure around it, but that's the idea of it. So they, they would work together on solving problems. Yeah. That help? Um, oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> no, too. Well, I was gonna, um, one other question was um, about the white belts, um, 2,000 white belts, 2,500 employees. You know, it sounds like you're getting toward, um, you know, everybody, but is, is that just, you know, or why, who would not be a white belt? Or is that just a realization that some people are always kind of moving in out of the organization? Yeah, and never exactly. Get to we would, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that there's a, there's going to be this ebb and flow of people coming in out of the organization. And so I think we would probably like to keep a status of like 2,000. I mean, probably the goal would be, other, again, a lot of the discussion needs to be centered around the fact that this team about yearly or every 18 months changes our focus and, and, and changes the way we do things. We, we try and spend time reflecting on what we're doing and trying to improve it. So we've, we've been really, in fact, I'm going to talk, talk about a change that we made just in the last year that we've had to kind of adapt and, and move into. So I think that the 2,000 would be the folks coming in and out. We'd like to keep a, a level of 2,000 um, frontline staff. And I think maybe someday we, we would like to, you know, I, I guess I mean, the, the, the intake process or the orientation process for a new employee is three or four days, but we would like to take a few hours to get people as they come in and train them as white belts. We haven't gotten there yet, but we're, we're thinking about that. So that that number is kind of when you're sitting at 2017 when we did we wrote or we wrote that plan last year year and a half ago we said ah what's a good number we have 2500 let's let's try let's shoot for 2000 yeah uh, so that's that number I don't think we okay. we whittled it down far enough to say we keep we keep at 2000 I don't think there's a magic number it's just a matter of of where the culture goes the interesting part um, and I have a slide about later but the, the interesting part of what about that is when you train the frontline staff who haven't had people talk to them about things, you know, the, the housekeeper or the food service worker, and they start to realize that you're empowering them to start to solve their own problems, they get really excited, and yeah. then they want to learn more. So I think that that's kind of where we want to get to. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. If it's okay, there's a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Is that sure. okay at this point? Um, so I'm going to combine uh, Gene and Marsha asked kind of related questions. Have you created all of your own material, which I, I think you answered, but you can recap. And then all, are your trainings done in person or through video? Good questions. Um, no, we stole most. No, we, we, we stole from different places. Um, I had a lot of material from Ohio State when I, you know, that I brought back and uh, we've made some of it our own and we've found some stuff on the internet. We, we do, when, when we do the yellow belt two day training, in person, uh, we ask them to give us two full days, and we have we do a Kanban demonstration, and we do a, a, a flow simulation, and we show some videos, and we try to keep it interactive so that they that no one gets really bored of just me talking to them for two days, which is, would be interminable. So um, <laughs> they, yeah, we try and keep it moving along, and and uh, so it's in person, and I think we've just taken. And it's changed. We've done it three different ways, and it's changed every time. And we go, okay, we don't like that slide. That slide, we tried it. We thought it was going to be good, and we'll sit as a team, the seven of us, and go, okay, we don't like that slide. That's what we're going to make it be. And how do we get that point across? So, no, it's in person, and we are always continuously updating it, it appears, we feel like. Okay. Great. And then um, there's another question here from uh, Jenna. Uh, I'm currently a black belt with multiple projects under me at different organizations. I'm currently in an organization with a quote unquote lean team with what I would say is questionable belt training. And I'm not part of that team. Do you, here's the, the, the question after the background, did you require your potential black belts to be trained or retrained by you? Or how would you address a new hire with prior belt training? Um, valid question. I, I think, um, because then that's part of the, if you're on LinkedIn and you start to see all the discussion about Lean Six Sigma and who's trained and who's not and where we get it from, we pretty much set the standard as the more steam training. So if we had someone who'd come through the black belt training through more steam, we would say, okay, you're good to go. Um, all of our hires to date have been in-house. So we, we hire folks that 
that, you know, uh, we do a group interview and we, we ask them behavioral based questions. And then the, the, the first six, eight months of their tenure with us is spent working on that black belt through more steam. And then they have, a, they have to do two projects with that. So it begins their work. There's two projects to, for that black belt through more steam. So, yeah, that would be it. So if you if you come to us from, with a Morstein black belt, you're good to go. We we've never seen that yet. Um, otherwise, we're gonna, and we'll pay for you. We we pay for it. Um, but we would get you that same level of training. So that we're all that was my black belt, and that's that we're all the same. Mm -hmm. we can okay, make. and then um, one more question, oh, and I'll save some other questions for for the end. But uh, Kristen asked, do you train to a certain methodology, Demaic or PDCA? If so. Why did you select that? Fabulous question to make. Um, mostly because for me, honestly, personally, I don't, I, PDCA always makes it, I don't understand what step stage I should be in. I'm sorry to say that. Um, but the make to me is a more standardized approach. So we're going to define the problem, measure, analyze, improve, and control it. Um, it, it I think as, P, as long as people are, because I'm not going to sit here and debate the bank versus PDA, mm -hmm. you know, but I think that, I think that, as long as you're using some kind of scientific method to solve your problems, it doesn't matter to me what you're calling it, right? Um, if you if you if you're using a process to solve your problems, it could be A B C D for all I care. As long as we're staying with that uh, with that process, that, that's my opinion. And, that's how and, I and it. It, as long as you're again. You don't want to debate A, B, C, D. I was going to debate that with you, but I no, guess we, yeah, I'll, of course I'll, let you, I'll let you. I'll let you move on. Let, let me slide. So, on. In, the, in the next section here, you can talk about um, some of the the results and the and the benefits. So you've kind of teed up that you've got these different roles, this different type of training and belt levels and champion. Mm -hmm. um, so that leads to the you know the next question of so you know what what's the impact? How are you doing? What are How are numbers? we doing? Great question. We've trained 220, actually 235. I looked at it yesterday. We we kind of have this continuously ongoing. It was interesting because we felt that we would reach out to to the department directors to say, hey, do you want your staff to be trained? And we put this notice out in our newsletter, and all of a sudden we had a lot of frontline staff going, we want to be trained, and, and the director didn't even know anything about it. So we've been we've been working through that. We we really like to have the support of the director when it happens. 219 yellow belts, and those are the, are, the, are the director level mostly. And we've had a few frontline staff members become yellow belts. They were interested. They got yellow. They got white belt training, and they said, "Hey, I want to. I want to do yellow belts." So we're 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 open to that. Um, zero green belts. We have had. Yeah, we've only been in at it a year, so we haven't had anybody complete three three A3s yet to our satisfaction. I think we have one person who's completed one. So it's. I think that the the for us and in healthcare the. Um, the, from a from a leadership standpoint, they're busy doing doing their job, and they see this problem solving as something extra. And as I talk to people and coach, I say this is not an extra thing that you're doing. This is this is the job, um, and so we're, we're we're getting there. Okay, so we're, you can see our progress. We're we're our, we had our our goal was 200 for the first year. We just completed our first fiscal year with that, so we we, we made that, and now we're moving to another. We want to get another 200 this year. Our, our year runs October. Mm -hmm. um, what are the impacts been? We think that um, people across the system are using more and more of the terminology. They're um, focusing more on data uh, when we talk about it, and we're trying to get them to slow down. Uh, that's an issue. They want to rush in and fix problems. But we think that more and more people are, are talking about, you know, let's, let's really define the problem before we move on. And then most of the departments are huddling. And then this is this has kind of come from admin that says we need to be huddling, but we started this five or six years ago. Um, when we, we would do a project, part of the project would be you got to huddle and you got to talk about data uh, improvements and what you're working on. So I think that's been it's been pretty good. And frontline staff, as I talked about, they're, they're energized and engaged. When we go out and talk to them, um, they're jazzed. They want to try and make it better. They can see. And so we just need to get the alignment uh, from leadership on that. Um, and then Mark wanted me to talk about as we as we built this what the what the uh, data driven improvements were. So here's one of our projects, and this was on um, IV stop time. So for you know for if you're not in if you're not in healthcare, don't worry about this. But these are error rates. You can be anything in front of the, the word error rates, and you can see the goal was less than 10%, which still is not good. It's not perfect. 
But you can see the three different uh, EDs were having some problems. Emergency departments were having problems with um, getting this proper documentation, which resulted in a lot of downstream problems and some billing issues. So once we began to work on it, and this was one of my black belt project, one of my black belts projects. You can see uh, how those error rates. Once we started to put some things in place with IT, um, you know, we've been able to pretty much eradicate most of those. Now we're down under under ten percent. We'll see if leadership wants to go for that. You know, we're in the red zone now. Does the leadership want to go for that other extra ten percent? So that's some of the some of the work that we've been able to do, and we're getting leaders to look at. You know, think of things in a pass, fail, don't look at averages, and begin to look at data that helps drive your improvements. So we're, we're getting there. So what have we done well? We had good support from our executive leadership. Um, they, they've, anything we've asked for, they've done for us. We've, they allowed us to add two people last year in our, in our drive towards eight embedded. We've, again, we've paused that. But there has never been, we are pretty much on our own. We, uh, you know, we create our own stuff and we set up trainings and they don't get in our way, which is just perfect. Um, we did complete improvements in a wide variety of hospital departments. So we've been all over the building. We worked in revenue cycle and finance and in our clinics as we have a whole bunch of physicians that we employ. Pharmacy, um, we start a big one tomorrow or next week in, uh, in the emergency department. And then we coach leaders, students, and the new one to me, when I asked my team uh, before in preparation for this, I said, what could we do better? And one of their responses was ourselves. We could do better coaching within our team. So I think that's something that we're working on and we want to uh, uh, get better at. And then we implemented improvement software. Um, you know, the Kinexa system has been instrumental in this latest venture this, that I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, we really like it. So that was a big, a big step for us. So what can we do better? Here we go, better involvement from executive leaders. While they have been uh, very supportive and they talk about it, only two of them have come to our yellow belt training to actually begin to understand uh, what it is we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish. But So they support us, go and do, but they're not out there leading with us. So um, we would like to encourage them to kind of step in a little bit more in, these next, in the next coming years. Leaders still struggle to rush to solutions. If you've been in healthcare, you know this is what happens. Nurses and doctors want to rush in and be the heroes and save save the day. And I think we push them really hard to fully define the problem and study it um, before we, to make sure that we know. You'll hear my team going, do we really know this? So that's, that's kind of one of the things that the system can do better. And then, like I talked about, we do more coaching within our team. Uh, I think it's an untapped resource that we kind of have been missing on and that the team identified it. So that was kudos to them. And then uh, for our users to provide more timely updates to our improvement software, the kind of access changes every month and we got to do better telling people what's going on with it. So um, that's what we can do better. And then um, we need to define process of resourcing the CI staff. We, we've been kind of, for a while, we were project-based and we had a steering team and then the administration did away with the steering team and we we uh, kind of been you know, directors would come and go. Hey, I need some help with this, and so we would do that. Um, so coming up is is a discussion on that. So we we kind of had to derail our plan a little bit uh, of of embedding uh, black belts because we were kind of hitting some financial challenges and we're not really hiring anybody. Um, so we we had to delay that development of the team um, as we go through this. And we created, the administration created a, what they call a value enhancement program, uh, which is, which they've, they've tasked directors to have three 90-day uh, workouts, if they will, per, you know, every, every three, every four months, uh, to try and drive costs or improve value in the system. So we're hoping that as administration begins to focus on these individual projects, there'll, it'll be a tool to resource my team to go and help and the training with the yellow belt and the white belts will help that too. So the, the, the goal of the, the value enhancement pro program or whatever, whatever we would call it is to reduce our cost per unit of service. So these are the folks, we have two folks that work on business development. If you see a chance to grow your business, these are the folks that you would talk to. And then uh, if you're looking to reduce waste, we're the people uh, that you, that they would talk to. And, and what we've done in this, this cycle of it now, we've actually assigned 
the black belts, the CI team, two directors to coach them. So we said, okay, you, you, you know, each, C, each CI specialist has a uh, has eight or ten people that they're meeting with routinely to coach them through these projects to help. And then we have financial coaching from our um, finance department. So what it looks like, and this is a screenshot from our Connexus system, each of the vice presidents has their, their projects that are running underneath them, and they can keep an eye on them. Uh, and, and they actually can manage that when they meet with their directors to say, how are we doing with the, you know, the healthcare source corporate compliance module project, whatever that means. Um, and so that's how we monitor and watch that. Um, at the bottom of this, you can't see everything well, but there's some, the kind of system will total up as they put in proposed costs and proposed, you know, uh, savings and, uh, the total, the total chances. And this is how we manage, uh, each of these projects. So to to date, we did 260 total projects. Um, the, I thought the 75 of no value was kind of funny in that we basically tried, and it's actually a good learning experience. We tried some stuff. We thought this sounds like a good idea, but it didn't work. So, but we still we'll still try and celebrate those. Um, the JDIs are just do it, um, just things that they know they're going to go do. So um, we have 32 million in proposed enhancements with a fairly big upside if we can make all these things stick uh, for the next year. So we're starting our second cycle now and with the coaches. Our newest feature, and I'm going to tell Kinexus, and uh, it's helped us a lot to focus because when you have 70 directors doing 30 to 30 uh, or three projects each, that's a fairly high number. We created a priority tool um, that allows administration to look at the, the, the higher the more important thing. So the higher the number, the more important it is uh, based on a set of criteria that we developed. So this is the new feature that we're using is we're hoping that what we're uh, hoping we will wish to have happen is that they would say, okay, that one that's a 10, we want to put the CI specialist on that and you would work with the director and, and see that come to fruition. So we're really excited about this and you can see the, the potential at the bottom is, is pretty, pretty good if we would realize all those savings. So, Mark, I will turn it over to you. That's your slide. For any more questions or anything else? <laughs> there, yeah, there there are more questions, so we will um, have a good chance for uh, Q and A, and and you and I to have some more uh, discussion, Mike. Uh, so, thank you, um, thank you for sharing the approach and some of the the thoughts and lessons, and what we'll kind of uh, have a chance to. Dig deeper, but while you're uh, catching a breath and taking a sip of water, I want to tell the <laughs> audience, uh, not that it's not like you needed it, but it's just a, a good, <laughs> here's your opportunity. I want to make a few announcements. Uh, we have uh, upcoming webinars, and uh, we're real excited about continuing those in the future. Um, you can always find more information at www.kinexus.com slash webinars. If you sign up for uh, our blog newsletter or um, our, our general Kinexus newsletter, you'll be emailed about future webinars. Uh, tomorrow, if you are a Kinexus customer, you can register for uh, what's formally, I think, called Office Hours. It's informally called the Banna Rippy Show, where Matt Banna and Ryan Rippy will um, amaze and delight you with uh, some tips and ideas about how you can better utilize uh, Kinexus software. And then open for our, our broader community, including everybody uh, who's registered uh, today, whether you are a customer or not. Um, it will be the third webinar in the last couple of years presented by Jess Orr. And, and Jess is formerly of Toyota um, in, in the US. She's doing uh, work at a, another company now. So she's got this really interesting perspective of having learned on the inside of Toyota and now you know going through uh, the type of lean transformation effort that a lot of you might be going through. And she's done some webinars in the past, which you can find in our webinar library about uh, personal A3 problem solving. And on January 10th, she's going to do an extension of that. The, the formal title is actually going to relate to uh, New Year's resolutions, Hoshin Conry style. But the idea is talking about the Hoshin Conry methodology or strategy deployment and how to apply that for personal goal setting and um, execution of your improvement plan for the year. So uh, registration will be open soon for that. Um, you can go to the next slide, please, Mike. I'm sorry. That's right. Um, so as I mentioned, we have the continuous improvement 
webinars on demand library. We've got uh, a blog. We actually have two blogs. One is uh, for just uh, anybody. And then a second one, I mean, anyone can read it, but it's uh, a customer focused blog with uh, tips and ideas uh, for our customers. You can find all of that by going through uh, the menus at kinexus.com. And one other thing I'd like to tell you about is our podcast series. The audio of this webinar, along with the others, will be in our podcast feed. Um, you may have heard Mike and I did a short podcast discussion as a preview of this webinar. We do that uh, in general um, with our webinars, and sometimes we share other stuff in the podcast. You can find that through iTunes or uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Stitcher. More information at kinexus.com slash podcasts. And Mike, it's a good thing we have time for Q&A because we've got a lot of questions and um, you can see Mike's email uh, address there uh, if you want to reach out and um, talk some more. Um, so there's a question from Evan. Um, I love that people feel empowered through your training. So how does the organization keep up the momentum and sustain that level of excitement over time? Great question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're going to try to continue that. We, we're working with um, a badge system in Kinexus so that as you complete some different things, it will automatically award some badges, and then we can maybe do some higher-level uh, recognition of pe people that are doing some really good work. Um, we'll, we'll keep doing the training as people come in. But I think that the secret sauce to it is that with the frontline staff is simply – that you, if leaders are listening to the frontline staff, it will continue. If a frontline staff person has an idea and says, hey, Mark, I think that's a great idea, and Mark doesn't answer me for six months, and, uh, you know, nothing ever happens. Uh, we were discussing it today with my team that someone had they'd tried some, they'd asked to do some things in one of the offices, and the previous manager had said, no, no, we can't do that. And um, they just quit asking. So we were right. working with them now. So I think the the the, thought, the secret is that if lead, it's going to come back, it always comes back to leadership and any kind of lean transformation or cultural transformation. In my opinion, if if the leaders are listening to their staff and trying that, that will continue to build. If they don't, we won't. Yeah, you know, I, I totally agree. It, it comes back to leadership, and you know, the last really uh, belt driven organization I worked for, it was actually. The last manufacturing company I worked for back in 2004, 2005, and they were really proud. It was good that they were putting people through a rigorous uh, green belt training program. Um, they had uh, roughly 500, let's call it 500 green belts, and there were the certificates on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, I think the number of total green belt projects ever completed was 502 meaning one for each certified belt right. and then just a handful. And that's not the fault of the training. That's certainly not the fault of the belts. I think that was a reflection of the culture where leadership uh, wasn't engaging people the way, uh, the way you were talking about. Right. So we think that our cult, we think that this new change with this value enhancement um, will help us get in front of the directors and be coaching them. I think that's really the only way, um, yeah. that you can, you can impact that. You, you, you know, you, you give them a goal and, and kind of get out of the way, but you got to coach them. You know, you got to tell them, you know, mm -hmm. bring this back to the center where if they get, you know, cause, cause leaders want to run off and solve. And the hardest thing is telling a, a nurse that no, you can't go solve your team's problems. They have, you have to teach them to solve their own. Um, and that's yeah. hard for them. Yeah. Um, so talking about value and, and, and different dimensions of, of benefit, Gina asks, um, when you're selecting improvement initiatives uh, to move forward with, do you do uh, a preliminary cost benefit analysis? And then there's a, I'll, I'll follow that up with kind of a related question. So from a financial perspective, do you do any sort of upfront cost benefit projection? At this point, no, they should be doing, I mean, uh, we don't, uh, they should be doing that with their, with their vice president. Um, uh, you know, I think that administration needs to be putting out where we need to be, and then people need to be hitting it. We're kind of doing it a little differently with the directors looking at their own areas going, I can save this. I can, I can, so there is no official cost benefit at this point. Um, mm -hmm. We just use that priority score. Yeah. And it there is kind of functionality, by the way, that allows you um, to sketch out your preliminary cost benefit ROI and then follow that up and, and compare it to your actual. 
Right. And what we found is that this is we're starting our second round. We did this last spring and we worked through the summer. Um, what we've found is that most of the directors are doing what we call just do it, the, the JDIs. They already know what they're going to do. I just need to go do it. Um, so really, it doesn't, doesn't require any kind of buddy with a belt to, if you're, you know, we look at them and say, if you already know what you're going to do, don't call us, go do it, right? Um, yeah. We want to help you solve problems that you, that you haven't seen yet or that you don't know how to fix. And so we're going to go get this low-hanging fruit, if you will, hopefully, and then mm-hmm. the next this round or next, we'll start to get into some deeper and actually get people to change the way they do the work to improve it. Yeah. And then Kristen asked, uh, are, are belts leading um, quality improvement projects? And if so, how do they align with your quality and safety? Uh, what is DPT? Uh, I don't know that acronym. Perfect question. And we just met yesterday with with Jake from, from Kinexus. Not from Jake from Safety Farm. Jake from, Jake from Kinexus. <laughs> and we built uh, a root cause analysis form in for our quality program. And we're working on quality collaborative teams, and we're going to build those into Kinexus too to help drive that. So we we hope to play in that arena. We would like to be in, in, invested in that because I think I think for me that's where we should we should focus. Let's improve the quality, and the finances will, will, will line up. I would think. But yeah, and and Kristen followed up DPT. She uh, she just meant department. So quality and safety department. Yeah. department. Quality, yeah. quality uh, department. I, I was, I, I think I, yeah, I was thinking through, you could also ask how do those projects align with quality and safety metrics for the organization? They, at this point, it's all financial. Okay. We should be lining them up with that. And I agree with that. It's a great question. Um, we just need to kind of drive that question. And from the quality department it needs to be, you know, go on. Don't forget this out here that, you know, we, you know, by decreasing readmissions, we can, we can do this, but that's a, that's you know that's one of those um, across department uh, projects that we haven't really been successful at tackling yet. So we're hoping as we get more folks trained and understanding the process of solving the problems and working together, um, we can start to tackle some of those bigger issues. Yeah. All right. Uh, Gary asks, um, when your improvement activities have resulted in a best practice that has broader potential across the hospital, what have you found useful to help replicate and roll out that idea? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, yeah, we haven't really tackled that. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, we, we, we try and tackle it through standard work as we write up standard work and get people used to working with standard work. I mean, this is that we're still in the infancy of this. I mean, we, we started this plan a year ago. Uh, we, we just completed year one of our plan so we really haven't had that opportunity yet to go, this is a, a new way to do this. Now, we did do it with, it, so I guess, Barbara, I wish to go back. Like our, our IV stop times, we spread that across, that, that change across three hospitals, and we did it with three emergency departments. So we did that with standard work, and we set up the computer to work the way we wanted, needed it to work to answer those questions and, get, and eradicate those errors. So I guess we have done some of that, but typically I think right now to, uh, where we're at, it would be standard work. That's a, that's a really good question. Yeah, and you know, I mean, in general, a lot of our Kinexus customers use uh, our software platform to help uh, you know, the, with, with the repository of ideas that, uh, that's searchable. So you, you can create opportunities for people to pull um, different practices or improvements into their own area. I think I think it helps to challenge people to build upon what's already there. You know, you think in terms of maybe you know having better practices that um, aren't perfect, so um, others can uh, adopt or maybe adapt the method or improve upon the method and share that back through Kinexus. And then, you know, there, there are mechanisms to sort of, I think there's a time and a place to sort of push and nudge people and say, hey, we've done something that I think would be helpful for you. Um, so what do you think, you know, and, and, and present that to someone that yeah, I think you have to say, what, what would it look like? Uh, what would it look like if we did this? I think for us, though, too, what we have found is that we, we look at physician clinics and we've got a whole bunch of docs offices out there and they're all doing their own thing. So we may find success in clinic A, we go, hey, let's spread that. Well, Clinic B is doing, they're still doing family practice, but they do it completely differently. Um, so I, when I get, when, when we start talking about best practices, I kind of go, that the best practice is, is what works for you. Um, this is so, I like to take that thinking, you know, we, we did this in this, in this physician's clinic and we improved this aspect. 
um, here's what we did here. What do you guys think about in your clinic? Because it may be one doc and two APPs, and it may be another cl- clinic, maybe three docs and one APP, and they all have different roles, and they all practice differently. Uh, um, to try to, to trying to herd those cats can be tough. So you can, you want we try and just take that thinking. We, this is the thinking we applied here. What do you think? Heck, what can we do in this clinic to improve that measure? Um, because the physicians are still all kind of allowed to practice how they want to practice. And that is, that's a very general, um, healthcare challenge. Um, yes. that's, that's, yes. I think and that's not know. a slam. That's just life. Yeah, it's just, we have to understand. It's, yeah. That, that, that is, that sounds like, uh, that's a fair assessment of the current state in a, a lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of settings. So, um, Ira asked if you could elaborate a little bit more, do you know some of the detail or some of the background information about how those IV error rates were reduced? Yeah, I'm the wrong person. I mean, I think it was just looking at the way they were doing it in the times and and how they, I mean, we could talk more offline or I could hook you up with the black belt that, that did that project. Um, but I know she changed, they changed some things in the computer system so that they were recorded and, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I could pull it up on Kinexus, okay. but that would take too Well, long. that's right. Yeah, so I mean, I'll invite Ira if you're still on. Um, reach out to Mike via email, and yeah. um, he he can uh, make that connection. But you know, I'm I'm looking at the chart that you had shared um, that that shows the reduction. And you know, if I were to draw a, a quote unquote control chart or a process behavior chart, um, it does look like there's some fairly significant you know downward shifts. Um, in those error rates, right, that that go beyond the realm of of just fluctuating and being slightly better. So I, I think there's good visual evidence there, statistical evidence of uh, of that reduction going from the ranges of you know the one the one uh, line uh, the one site looks like the average had been about 75 percent error rate, and then that average fell to about 10, where it's kind of above and above you know below the goal. It's fluctuating, but it's it's definitely lower than it was before. So. And then you get into the realm of setting goals. Should it be zero, right? I mean, um, so that's, we discussed that a lot. Should it be zero? Should we, you know, and where do you, maybe we set the, the goal at zero with a warning at 10. You know, we're, we'll, we'll allow you mm-hmm. to work below 10% error rate, but if you jump up, then we need to come and help again. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're, yeah. we're trying to indoctrinate that kind of thinking too, that doesn't have to be exact, but know when, know when to react, and that's the subject of your most recent work, right? Know when to react. Yeah. react to well, and yeah, and, there, and there's an art, or you know, there, there's different philosophies around goal setting. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know, you know, as, as a non clinician, you know, what, what the impact of, um, you know, a stop time error is. But, you know, there, there are some, like, you know, Paul O'Neill, who was the CEO at Alcoa and has been involved in healthcare. Um, you know, he would talk about inspirational goals, aspirational goals of zero harm. But on a year to year basis, you might set an intermediate goal of 50 uh, percent reduction. Right. Because, you know, you, you definitely don't want to set a goal of zero, not support people and then blame and punish them for not hitting the goal. You know, right. What Paul O'Neill um, did and talked about was setting the aspirational goal, setting a challenging short term goal, but then certainly providing the leadership and the methodology uh, for how to get there. I, I think that's what keeps a goal of zero from being, uh, you know, some people say, oh, that might be demoralizing. Well, let, mm-hmm. let's do things that help it not be demoralizing. Right. Um, all right. So we've got a lot of other questions here. Another one from Gary, you know, with with 200 yellow belts and your goal of 2000 white belts, what, what are you doing then to, uh, to embed uh, continuous improvement into daily activities uh, beyond projects? Yeah, that, that's going to come back to, to thinking like two second lean, right? How do we how do we get people improving it a little bit every day? And I think the the trick will be to you know set reasonable goals on reasonable metrics. Um, you know, focus on one or the other. I was in a meeting last week and somebody said, well, we're focused on 12 goals. And I'm like, whoa, 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 you know, you can't, you can't do that. Um, so um, I think that we'll focus them on, you know, in their, in their daily huddle, we talk about, we try and talk about, you know, what, what we're working on now, what's the goal, where are we today, what, what went wrong yesterday or not went wrong, what were the barriers yesterday, 
that kept us from hitting the goal or did we meet the goal? And, and, and the hard thing in, in, that we find in healthcare too is celebrating enough the successes to stop and go, hey, great job, you know, that's you know, way to go. So we've also got to get better at that, at celebrating our, our wins because we do, we do do some good work. Um, did I answer the question? I'm, I am, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with. Yeah, like how, I mean, so how do you begin to build that into someone's daily routine? And and it's and it's just giving them, you know, giving that that frontline staff housekeeper the ability to to change how he or she does the you know something and and with the team and and then just give them the ability to do that right, and give them the tools to make their mm-hmm. job better. So I don't I don't know how else you would do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, to your point, um, making it a daily habit, I mean, it's kind of a circular definition, um, leaders making it a daily habit to ask people what the barriers are, what could we do better, what ideas do you have? You know, that's, that's what Joe Schwartz, um, you know, and, and I wrote about in our Healthcare Kaizen book, and, mm-hmm. and you know, there are organizations who, you know, who, who make that effort. But, um, you know, maybe let me let me tie that that line of thought to uh, Stefan's question, um, you know, what, what, what sort of, what do you think about creating a burning platform or helping establish a sense of urgency to, to drive change? So, you know, we can ask that around self sense of urgency to do projects or sense of urgency to try to do daily improvement. I mean, you know, is there a burning platform that comes from leadership or is this just a good necessary thing to do? Uh, I think that that leadership has created, uh, you know, when when they share our financial situation and what's going on, and that the, the, there there is a burning platform that that people need to um, change what they're doing. Um, I I don't know what more. Yeah, they that attempt has been made. So so we're trying to show them this is one way to to, to accomplish that. Um, yeah, I I can't think of any other better way than what the way they've done it. I mean, I. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they should. People should be getting it right. That we've yeah. got some issues we need, to, we need to clear up. Yeah, and then there's a second part of the question: Are there any incentives put in place, monetary or, or otherwise, or have you considered, um, you know, financial incentives or uh, other other ways to motivate people? Yes and no. When 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 you complete the training, it's it's kind of funny because people are like you didn't. We give them badge holders that are colored specifically for what the the training is. So if they're if they're a yellow belt, they get a badge holder that has a, a yellow thing. Um, so so that that is a, usually enough. I mean, and we're working on badges. <coughs> excuse me, in the Kinexa system, where as I talked about, you would a leader could award a badge. So we're going to start going down that route then. We had we we talked actually we just had the meeting yesterday talked about what kind of little financial incentives but you, you try and shy away from any real big financial incentives because because I think that the intrinsic value of making your work better mm-hmm. is the reward um, yes and and the recognition we talked about when we have like a a large department meeting bringing teams down and letting the leadership know what they've done share that success and celebrate them there you know with with the punch and cookies or something. Um, nothing, nothing really big. I just, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big believer that, that money motivates people. I know it's a nice reward, but I'd rather have you just mm-hmm. shake my hand and say, great job. You know, having, we talked to you yesterday about having the CEO write thank you notes to, to folks on teams who have done good work. So as we start to recognize those people to go, Hey, thank you for your efforts. We appreciate it. That yeah. goes a long way versus the $10 gift card or something. I mean, it's just not. You know, mm-hmm. so we will probably try and shy away from large financial things. There might be little things or parking place yeah. for a day or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, when we talk about rewards and recognition, we can flip that equation. Uh, recognition, like you said, goes a long way. Uh, intrinsic motivation m- means a lot. I think in in different industries, when it's you know, how do you make your work easier? Fix what bugs you. Like Paul Akers says, with uh, with two second lean, I think in healthcare the intrinsic motivation to help patients is uh, you know super powerful um, and something to tap into as well. You know, there's a lot of history from the realm of uh, suggestion box systems. I mean, I saw this at 
General Motors, you know, 1995, how dysfunctional that was when the company promised a percentage of cost savings to people because mm -hmm. the selection of what to implement was completely out of the control of, of people doing the work. You know, there would be a lot of arguing and fighting and bickering over what an improvement was really worth. And, you know, all of that just ends up being a distraction um, from, from the challenge at hand. Yeah, and did, did the improvement really impact the bottom line? Did it, you know, that's kind of our challenge right now. If someone says, well, I've got a, this will, this will impact a million dollars. Well, that would be great. But did it really? And did you sustain it? We've seen a lot of projects that we thought we had nailed down and would walk, you know, kind of hand over to the leadership because we would move mm -hmm. on to, and that's a problem with being project based. If you're embedded in the department, you would go, no, that's not, not, not that we'd keep our eye on that metric. But we would move on to another, you know, like more of a consultative role. We'd move on to the next project, and that one would start to backslide because leadership wasn't necessarily watching it. So you could say, you know, for three months we did this and saved, you know, $100,000. But if you let it backslide, um, you know, then you really didn't impact anybody. So, yeah. That's all I got on that one. We'd, we'll try and stay away from financial rewards if we can, if I have anything to say about it. Sure. Um, let's see, we've got a couple minutes. Um, Michael asks, have you considered using elements of, of TPS such as Gemba boards? So some people would call this daily lean management or you know other other phrases like that, lean management system. Is that on the, uh, on the, yeah, the radar? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm kind of a student of Toussaint and his, his you know, management on the men book. And we, so we have huddle boards in each area. We've got status boards and some in our emergency department. And we, we're starting to incorporate status boards on the floor, patient status. Um, but, yeah, huddle boards would be it so far. Okay. Um, some of these questions are similar to things we've um, already addressed. So, um I will, Mike. I'll, I'll send you the list of um, the other questions. I think we're, we're we're similar, but if there's any of those that you want to address and reach out to people with, um, we'll go ahead and um, hopefully you can do that. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, as Mike said, oh, if we end early, we give people a little time back. We'll, we'll give you a minute or 45 seconds back uh, from the hour, uh, as my friend Mike Steckline, uh, who used to work at Catalysis, would say. Well, we ended on time. So, Mike, congratulations for that. We ended on time. But thank beyond you. that, I want to want to thank you for sharing uh, what you've been doing there and um, you know, your 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 progress and your plans for the future, and talking a little bit about how you integrate Kinexus into that. So, thank you for presenting. I want to thank everyone uh, for attending and and for all the questions that were generated. Mike, any final thought or thank you you'd like no, to give? Thank you for allowing me the opportunity. All right, and thank you, um, Kinexus customers. Tune in tomorrow for the Banna Rippy Show, and hopefully we'll see the rest of you on January 10th. Um, happy holidays and uh, best wishes uh, to everyone for the new year. Thanks. Thanks, Mark.